Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back. Dr. Jaws here. Hey Howard, what's up man? Good to see you. Happy Monday. Actually, happy Daylight Savings Time. Um, don't want to spill this. Um, but it's finally Daylight Savings Time. Um, I think both Canada... I think I, we talked about this last year. I think both Canada and the US has this. I'm pretty sure. So, um, the days feel brighter. Uh, we're getting uh, into the warmer part of the year. In this part of the world, um, the ocean is starting to warm a little bit, so we're starting to see a little bit of the beginning of uh, that seasonal shift for uh, some cool warm water critters coming up north. So it's still it's still like the cold regime, but um, I'm excited for this time of year. There's a lot to look forward to, so cheers to brighter days. So. But hope you had a good weekend. We've got a lot of cool stuff to do tonight uh, with the Bramble Shark. Echinorhinus uh, brucus. So, and it was kind of funny, like, uh, as always, uh, usually, like, or not not as always, um, there's some there's some nights where, like, I start out kind of, like, tired because it's, like, a Monday, and then as we get going, um, start to pick up. I had a really long day. Oh, cheers. Cheers, man. <laughs> I had a really long day yesterday. Uh, my, <laughs> my car has a, um, like, an air leak and like it was a slow leak and i was like traveling uh between like locations that are three hours away from each other so it was like um i i you know kind of like mapped the psi like the loss of psi to minutes in terms of like how much time like how much time do i have between like stops where i have to refill my air so it's been a long night last night um just kind of like <laughs> worrying about that but made it made it safe i'm gonna take my car uh into the shop tomorrow just to kind of like uh help it out but, um, but yeah, it's just been busy, uh, busy weekend, good weekend, but like really busy. So, um, did you do anything fun for the weekend? And also thank you so much for this beautiful, this is, this is really great. Um, this, this is a beautiful piece of art on the Bramble Shark. Um, and like, I just bravo on this for like, you know, this is the premier species for a brand new order, uh, a kind of rhinoforms. So uh, just bravo on the coloration. I love this piece. Um, just so you have this like really cool mix of iridescent hues with the classic bramble shark features. So you have like um, these white specks being the thorny de dermal denticles that are huge um, and kind of characteristic of this uh, group of sharks, the kind of rhinoforms used to be classified as squaliforms um, until recent research has been like, no, they're, they're so different and they're so distinct that they really are kind of their own thing. So um, one of the key features is, of course, the brambles. Um, there's two species, the bramble shark and the prickly shark. And um, I really love that you capture the, like, that key um, feature of the very large dermal denticles uh, throughout the body. And then also the weird position of the tail. We have this like really odd tail with a huge um, like lower caudal fin. And then um, the dorsal, and, or the first and second dorsal fin are really tucked back um, you know, further back on the body and like right, like very, very close to the tail, kind of to an unusual degree as far as sharks go. Same with like the pelvic fins as well. Um, so I love that you capture these key features, but then also like you've got this beautiful iridescence. So this awesome like blue and like um, violet iridescence going on along with the green eyes. So this looks beautiful, Howard. Thank you so much for sending this over. And uh, I really especially love uh, that added feature of uh, pike dogfish or spiny dogfish, Squalus acanthias, um, just a group of them on the seabed as well. Uh, this this actually, I mean, for me personally, that that makes me like personally really happy because um, these are sharks uh, off the Atlantic coast. So uh, these are like pike dogfish or spiny dogfish are unusual in that they can go between shallow and deep water, whereas most dogfish just like deep water. Uh, so they can go between both environments, and it's really cool to see that the bramble shark, a pretty pretty famous deep water shark, a pretty characteristic charismatic deep water shark, um, it's really cool to see them all interacting in this deep water environment. So uh, I love it. Chef's kiss. This is awesome. So thank you so much uh, for saying this, Howard. That this is this is one of my favorite pieces. So um, we've got a cool we got a lot of cool stuff to review tonight because um, we have a lot of cool footage on the prickly shark um, there's only one bramble shark clip I was able to get um, everything else is its cousin the prickly shark but I figured the prickly shark would probably be good to take a look at as far as like kind of getting an idea um, 
like as far as oh okay awesome yeah of course uh, yeah thank you thank you i just saw your comment um so i uh, hope i hope the weekend was relaxing um because it's like like for me it's like um i'm starting to feel kind of like itchy in terms of like the water is still freezing but like i'm starting to kind of get that itch of like oh man like i'm looking forward to like snorkel season scuba season like i'm, I'm really getting excited so um because like I, I, I totally interrupted my thought but like um like right now in this part of the world we are getting animals coming up that are feeding on plankton um like plankton i guess are starting to kind of bloom a little bit i mean like as far as like with the in increasing solar radiation you do get increased plankton blooms um and one of the big groups of fishes that come up here are um herring or menhaden or shad um, they're very famous on the East Coast for swimming up uh, bays and rivers, and um, they're actually a really important food fish where they'll eat um, or, like, harvest plankton. They actually have, like, little gill rakers just like basking sharks or whales. Like, they will be opening their mouths and straining the water for plankton and swallowing them, and um, they're a very, like, great food fish because they have a direct link, trophic, uh, a direct trophic link to... Uh, plankton, like phytoplankton, are the most like energetically, um, like uh, nutrient-packed, like nutrient-rich, energy-packed um, group of organisms, and like menhaden and herring and these kinds of fish, um, you know, they they really have like a direct link to it because they uh, consume it directly, and it makes them in turn like some of the best fish to eat as far as like other predators like sharks are concerned. So it's really cool. Like right now in March. And into April, we have, like, a lot of these herring coming in um, to the rivers and stuff. And then as the year goes on, it's like it's like the plankton are here, so the herring are following that. And eventually the sharks start following the herring, and other big fish start following the herring. So it's, a, it's an exciting type of year. Um, this is, like, peak basking shark season for this time, for this part of the Atlantic. Um, oh, what was riding my motorcycle in February, wanting to go fossil hunting. Yeah, fossil hunting. We actually have uh, some cool fossils to review tonight of the bramble shark. So um, we'll, we'll uh, take a look at some clips of like uh, the bramble shark and a prickly shark. And then I think we'll just dive right into the fossils and then kind of explore some of the uh, literature. Is it's We got a lot of cool pieces tonight. Um, but fossil hunting is one of my favorite wintertime things to do um, where we do have a couple sites that are not too, too cold. Um, where sometimes you can get teeth on the beach. So, um, like that's, that's whenever like it gets too cold to like swim or snorkel, I, I pivot to fossil hunting. So, um, where are some sites that you go to Howard? Like, do you have, do you have, uh, local sites kind of nearby? Um, and I'll, I'll type in some of my favorites, but, um, Chip Oaks Plate, uh, State Park is on the south side of the James River. That's actually a pretty decent place for some shark fossils, and I've gotten um, white shark fossils uh, from there. So it's, I think they're starting to catch on with their social media about like advertising, oh, we have fossil hunting as a feature of the park, but it's, I don't think it's as famous as some other places. So that's a big one. Um, unfortunately, it's like kind of the only one I've got because uh, Westmoreland was a place in Virginia that used to have um, a lot of fossils, but I feel like it's gotten so popular that that's been kind of like a bit clean a little bit. But Caledon, Caledon is a good place for old fossils, like sand tiger fossils. So, um, but yeah, if you have a site nearby, uh, please drop it in the chat because I'm if, if you want to give up the bearings. But like, um, I'm I'm just really curious. So. But um, yeah, so um, let's talk about basking sharks. So basking sharks in the summer, they go up to like the Gulf of Maine. Oh, hey, Niagara is next, but Bowmanville, Oshawa, Thetford, Arcona. Very cool, very, very cool. And are these marine fossils or is it like a mix of different things? Um, Cause I, I'm really, I'm not familiar with those assemblages. So um, like here we have, we do have shark's teeth. Uh, the big thing I would, I mean, would be shells. Um, like uh, Chesapecten is a very famous um, like scallop fossil. Ekphora is a, is a really cool one, um, like a cool snail um, fossil, or I guess gastropod fossil thing. Um, we do have, I had a buddy find like mammoth teeth, like mammoth bones, but um, those are so hard to identify for me. Um, 
But mostly we have like shellfish and shark teeth are, are kind of like the big things I would say over here. So, um, but um, anyway, so uh, last little thing about March uh, is just that uh, I was talking about the menhaden and the herring. Uh, basket sharks are here in kind of like the middle Atlantic. Um, they'll start to move up the coast and go to like the Gulf of Maine, like Massachusetts, Bay of Fundy, Maine, that area. Um, kind of like probably April, May. Um, so, but it's just really cool. This is a time of like phytoplankton growth and like filter feeding, um, you know, and we have whales here. Whales are a big thing this time of year. Um, so, and this is kind of like the end of their season, uh, down here in Virginia. So, um, or kind of not the end, but like kind of like the March is like the last major month, I would say. And then April, they start to kind of change. So, but anyway, so as far as YouTube goes, we only, we've only got one clip on the actual bramble shark, and then the rest are its close cousin, the prickly shark. Um, but let's check this out. This is from Ocean X, and I don't know. I guess I can zoom in to make it sort of big. But that's actually really cool. Even though this is a short, and I don't really like the vertical orientation. Um, you can actually see very clearly those thorny brambles. So those like white spots are actually enlarged uh, dermal denticles. So there's no other shark like this as far as um, having that feature where, um, and you can see how it gets its name, like bramble shark or its cousin, the prickly shark. Um, they're unique in having these uh, thorny patches on the body. So um, I'm curious, these guys get to be uh, 190 centimeters, 230 centimeters, 394 centimeters. So that is, what is that, five feet? Uh, we always got to do this conversion. Like, <laughs> let's see, centimeters, centimeters to feet. It, al it always irritates me, but. So maximum size for this kind of shark is about 13 feet. Wow, so that's actually, that's a, that's a big boy. But the average size is, uh, let's see, about eight feet. Still a pretty large shark, pretty large deep water shark. Again, one kind of odd thing about it is um, the two dorsal fins are equal size, but really far back on the body. Um, so, and that's unusual. Uh, we'll see another shot of it. Uh, another thing that's unusual is that the pelvic fins are huge and actually kind of as large as the pectoral fins, it seems. That's, that's an unusual feature. And look at that, pelvic fin, the pelvic fins and then the two dorsal fins are super far back near the caudal fin. So, interesting shape. Um, it has this beautiful muscular head. Uh, I'm kind of curious what the diet is, and I'm checking Sharks of the World uh, on the right, uh, just right edge of my screen right here. Uh, I know these are rare sharks, and we don't know a lot about them. One cool thing is that there's a theory that um, they have a suction um, action, like they can suck in prey, kind of like a nurse shark can, uh, but I think that's a theory. I don't think that's, I don't know how substantiated that is. So as we go through the research tonight, uh, it'll be kind of cool to cross-reference that. So, But uh, these are really cool. I'm excited that we're uh, like unlocking a whole new order. Um, you know, and again, when I was growing up, there was only eight shark orders, and this is the ninth. So we didn't have echinorhinoforms when I was younger. And uh, this has been a recently established uh, order of sharks. So, oh, Howard, I just saw your comment. All marine, mostly Devonian, with some Ordovician and Silurian. I'm interested in spiny sharks and Silurian. Super cool. Uh, we also have some Pleistocene deposits here in Toronto that includes Irish elk and giant beaver. That, wow. So, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I didn't know we had Irish elk in North America, and it makes sense, but I had I didn't know. I thought that was a thing. I mean, this sounds dumb, but like, I thought that was a thing like in the British Isles, like Ireland, and, and like I didn't realize we had that here. So that's really cool. Um, it's kind of amazing to see like how, hey, Minjus, what's up? Welcome back. Welcome back. Happy Monday. Uh, we were just talking about fossils, um, and we're sharing fossil sites around here. Or sorry, like around our respective locations. Um, so, uh, but like I, I'm, I didn't know we had Irish elk in North America. That's really cool. And I was just about to say, like, um, it, it is amazing to think about, you know, the United States and Canada, like or North America, like like well, not North, that's not North America. That's part part of North America. But the United States and Canada, or North America, past where it's like, 
you have, you have mastodons, mastodons, mammoths, mammoths uh, um, bison, bison, pretty much pretty everywhere. everywhere. Uh, uh, like, 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 it's such a strange, such a strange thing to imagine that, like, on the East Coast, the East Coast, the United States, bison, bison were a thing. Were a thing. You know, wolves, 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 we're talking about, talking about that before. You know, you know, or just like mammoths were a thing. Um, um, forgive me, forgive I me, no, no, if I, if I, if I, sorry about the audio, I don't know, know if, 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 like, I, I um, um, mess it up, by the way, as far as Mastodon versus Mammoth, I forget if there's a geographical difference between them, because we, we have, I thought we had both, um, let me look it up really quick while we enjoy this ramble short footage, hold on, Mastodon versus Mammoth. And please let me know in the comments if there's um, what the difference is. One is a metal band and one is a uh, prehistoric element. Uh, elephant. Let's see. I'm curious. Uh, Vin just says something with a skull. Here we go. Uh, radiocarbon dating shows that Macedon and Mammoths coexisted in New York State, so they both were here. Okay, I just I just want to make sure that I, I wasn't going crazy. So, okay, so both were here. So that's really cool. Um, also, um, just, if you know any fossil sites uh, kind of in your area, please leave a comment because um, I was uh, sharing some of the Virginia sites which have shark teeth and um, uh, prehistoric or like fossil shells, like fossil shellfish. But um, also, just as a recap, uh, we only have this one clip of the bramble shark, but we have multiple clips of its cousin, the prickly shark, so we'll hop over. Um, and I think this would be useful because these, this is such a, this, this group only has these two species. Um, so, and they're both of the same genus, Echinorhinus. So I thought it'd be good to kind of check out both, um, even though it's technically bramble shark night. Um, I think it's good to look at both as a comparison because some of the footage on the prickly shark is a lot, there's a lot more of it, strangely enough, and like, uh, it's pretty clear, um, and they're longer clips, so here we go. So again, it's very similar as far as like having the fins set super far back on the body. Uh, what you'll probably notice is a difference is that it looks like the prickly shark's brambles or thorns are few and far between, uh, or just not as large as the bramble sharks. Um, so, but it's definitely, you know, a close cousin they they look otherwise pretty similar it looks like the prickly shark is a little bit more of a flattened snout so but it's kind of cool to see this guy is sticking very close to the seabed so um you know you might describe this as like a benthic shark or a dorsal shark um you know just swimming really casually here it's cool to see this kind of shape where um again all the fins are so far back on the body but you still have this kind of like muscular build um and i'm very curious to see like what kind like what the prey items are for the shark especially since again it gets pretty large so let's take a quick glimpse at it's been a while since we've seen florida museum so let's take a quick glimpse at the florida museum of natural history just to see like what bramble sharks and prickly sharks are all about so oh here we go also some comments so i just want to catch up on these Um, let's see. American Mastodon is for south, I think. The dentition varies from Mammoth, which have flatter grinding teeth by comparison. Very cool. Oh, I saw that comment, Minja. So he's got a funny little face. Um, also, by the way, um, funny thing, like, and I was, I saw, I was watching, like, a TV show recently, and then, I don't know if Google is doing super targeted ads now, but I saw an ad for the, um, it was Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, which is pretty famous, but it was like uh, coastal sampling. Um, and uh, I, I was curious if it was like the Seacoast Science Center. Um, but um, I just saw your comment and just said the, um, uh, there's not really a lot of fossil areas, uh, which kind of makes sense because um, where, where, where I am, like there's a lot of like sediment buildup and like layers of like, like clay and, and um, like I think there's, there's so much more sediment kind of built up versus like when you get further north, the shoreline is a lot rockier. It's like, that makes sense if, if there's not as much um, up there. So, but um, anyway, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. Uh, let's see. 
So Bramble Shark. This is short, stout shark is suited for its life as a deep sea dweller. Uh, it lacks the classic prominent shark dorsal fin, having two small dorsal fins placed far back in the body. Again, it's very interesting to see that they're equally sized. Uh, tends to be dark shades uh, from olive or purple to dark gray or black. Scattered regularly with distinct thorn-like de thorn denticles or groups of denticles. Uh, because it's a deep water shark, it is rarely seen or even caught, so it's considered no threat to humans. So, I'm kind of curious about the English names. Bramble shark, mango tara, that's not English. Spinous shark, that's kind of fun, and spiny shark. Ooh, okay, this... This Greek name actually looks really cool. Akino Skylopsaro. Oh, Akino Skylopsaro. That's a really beautiful Greek name, actually. Let's see some other names. Um, da, 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 da. Terobrego. There's a lot of different names for this. Okahai in Finnish. Interesting. A lot, a lot of different names. Uh, pretty large distribution. Um, I think we have a preview of it here. So you have a couple sightings on the in the Western Atlantic, so the East Coast of North America. A lot more sightings like South Africa, Mediterranean, British Isles, Australia even, New Zealand, Japan. Very interesting. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, Bramble Shark is a rare deepwater shark, which has only been recorded sporadically and usually solitarily at widely dispersed localities throughout the world. Uh, it's kind of cool to think of these like sharks being by themselves in the deep, dark depths. Like that's actually really cool. These interesting loners. Um, uh, although very little is known about its life history, it is likely to be a slow-growing, late-maturing species. There's some published data on the decline of the species in the Northeast Atlantic in recent times. Uh, we don't have enough data to as assess the conservation status. Interesting. Deepwater bottom dwelling shark uh, found on the deeper portions of the continental shelf and upper slope. Uh, the recorded depth range is up to, uh, sorry, 18 to 900 meters. So that's actually kind of interesting. It does come into shallow water. Um, and then spends a lot of time in the twilight zone. Uh, much more common in depths greater than 200 meters, so that's like a twilight zone shark. It's considered to be rather sluggish. Let's see. Don't need to read the description as much. I'm just kind of scanning through this. I just laughed at the, uh, this, must, this may be confused with the Greenland shark, which is kind of funny. Those two look pretty different. I really love this. This deepwater shark is dark gray, olive, purple, black, or brown, with metallic reflections on the dorsal side. Uh, it kind of harkens back to your art, Howard. Uh, I really love the iridescence you captured here. So, uh, again, bravo. That, that looks really, really cool. Um, and, like... Really appreciate that because that, that's really cool reading the color description and um, seeing that line up. So, ooh, the teeth are curved toward the corners of the jaws, forming a cutting blade. So let's see if we could get a visual on that. Uh, usually, Shark References has that because that sounds like dogfish. Um, like dog. Eh, there we go. Okay. All right. So these are funky looking teeth. So, you have that beautiful curve, like that bulge, um, you know, that, that bulging blade, um, kind of, like, like, like that blade edge out uh, on the main cusp, but then you have these, like, kind of, like, um, tricusp, or it, look, it looks like a tricusp, um, like, you have these, like, two, two smaller size cups on either side, and then you have another set of much smaller cusps, so that's, like, what would that be? That would be, like, a Quinty cusp, <laughs> a quincusp, hold on, dicusp, tricusp, quadricusp, whatever five is, is it would be quinticusp, I guess, so, uh, point being, very spiky teeth, very unusual looking teeth, um, very odd, actually, because you, you can see them locking into, like, this smooth blade, and yet, um, this is so irregular looking right here. And you have to wonder, wow, what is the adaptation for this? These would these would be amazing fossil teeth to look for. Um, 
Quintcuspid. I like that. I, I just saw that, Howard. Quintcuspid. So. <laughs> I just saw that Min just rambling around because it almost rhymes with bramble. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a, it's a Monday. I'm I'm kind of. It's been a long weekend, so I'm just waking up a little bit. But um, uh, this is a good question, by the way. Do sharks usually have that many names? Um, so actually, uh, for the more widely distributed species and the more well-researched species, uh, yeah. Um, a famous example, like, uh, white sharks can have multiple names. Like, there's, like, great white, white pointer. I think, oh, I want to say white death is a name. Uh, let's actually look that up really quick. Um, let's see. Great white shark, Florida Museum. I'm actually really curious, because I thought, I thought there was, like, a bunch of names for white sharks, just out of curiosity, the charismatic species. Okay, yeah, white shark, great white, white pointer, uh, man-eater shark, that's really weird. White death, yeah, white death was the name. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought I, I thought it wasn't going crazy. And then here we go, lots of different names and lots of different languages, uh, which makes sense. It's just really cool to see across the world. Uh, Tiburon Blanco literally means white shark. Uh, Greek is uh, Sabrilius. I don't know if I should be pronouncing the S. Oh, I love the ja Japanese name. Hohojirozame. Hohojirozame. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, it's fun to see the different names. But actually, even though the white shark is super popular, uh, it looks like the bramble shark has more uh, international names. Yeah, I think that's that's more. So, um, Kalb in Arabic. Uh, Chenil? Chenil in French? I apologize. I always mess up French names. Kikuzame in Jap Japanese, very cool. Nagohai in German. Um, Pesclavo in Spanish. Man, a lot of cool names for this. Ronco in Italian. Rubio Rubioca in Spanish. A lot, of, a lot of different Spanish names, actually. Somaj in Danish. I don't know what that O-ish looking thing is, so <laughs> I probably shouldn't say it. Tagaj in Swedish. Uh, a lot of cool names for this shark, actually. Let's see the most modern distribution. Um, IUCN Redlist usually has pretty good distribution maps. Uh, yeah, not too different from the Florida map. And actually, uh, I don't know if the Florida map had South American um, entries for the Bramble Shark, but there we go. Look at that. So uh, this shark it can be found in South America. I'm very curious. To, I'm just want to zoom in on what the probable range is for um, the Atlantic uh, or like the North American Atlantic. So this is really cool. So you can find bramble sharks. Oh, this is actually there's something I need to point out here, but um, this is mostly accurate. There is something I have to point out here, though. <laughs> um, I need to take a drink of tea for this. Hmm. Um, so it is really cool to see that you can find the bramble shark off the coast from uh, northern Georgia to Virginia, and then from New York to Maine. So you could maybe assume there's really no major difference between Virginia and New York as far as the ocean is concerned. So you could probably fill in that gap and assume pretty comfortably that they're in between here as well. Um, there is something I needed to point out, and um, I love IUCN Redlist, and I don't really fault them for this. I kind of fault more like GIS entry stuff, so, um, but random kind of soapbox. So, you can see this range map includes the Chesapeake Bay, which is an estuary. It is a, it's an area that has a lot of freshwater input, and it, it's a mix of freshwater and saltwater. Uh, bramble sharks do not live here. Um, it, that's too fresh for them. And uh, I think what happened is like when they were making this map, they just kind of inputted like, okay, just populate all the locations that are beneath 18 meters and, you know, just fill in the blanks. And they did that, uh, but this, is, this part is not accurate because there's no way a bramble shark would enter the Chesapeake Bay. It's just too fresh. So I just need to point that out because if there's any shark that we talk about that kind of should be a deep water shark or should be like a ocean going shark and it goes into estuaries like this on maps uh chances are the map is wrong so um and that's just kind of just a little that's my soapbox um 
And I, I'm pretty... It's a pretty sensitive subject for me because it's like... I, I, I teach about sharks of the Chesapeake Bay. I talk about sharks of the Chesapeake Bay. Like, we have 12 species. Uh, if you really want to push it, you can push it to 16. If you include all the records of any little thing that just sneezed into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and, you know, people just get really enthusiastic of overestimating what we have in the bay. And the reality is, um, you know, we have this beautiful ecosystem of 12 to 16. Uh, sharks and bramble shark is not one of them white shark is not one of them so anyway uh that's my soapbox but i'm gonna catch up on some comments and look at some more footage again this is the cousin of the bramble shark the uh prickly shark so and this is a cool channel this is nautilus so um definitely please go ahead and like and subscribe to nautilus uh evie nautilus they do a lot of cool marine stuff these are super relaxing fun videos to watch so oh nice <laughs> i just saw that uh white death is a sick name yes uh it's it's pretty rad um it's so weird how the names are so different even in related languages yeah um so douglas bane welcome back prickly shark is a nice name yeah, actually, it's really cool to see. I, I would think of the two, um, the Bramble Shark would be more popular, but uh, it turns out as far as YouTube goes, there's a lot more prickly sharks. Uh, Howard, do you guys have Fossil Shark Teeth of the Chesapeake Bay by Bretton Kent? No. Ooh, I should get that, actually. Um, that's a pretty famous book, um, and I, I actually really should get that. So um, I'm going to store that just, just, just so I can... Uh, yeah, I'm gonna put that on my wish list actually. Thank you. That's that's a really great recommendation. So, by the way, fun fact: you might have noticed this video title. Um, this is kind of like fun shark trivia, but you notice shiver of prickly sharks. So you know how there's like a a gaggle of geese or a pod of whales or a pack of wolves. Uh, shiver is actually the correct weird English name for a collective of sharks. So and it applies to any shark. So a shiver of white sharks. Uh, the big one is like a shiver of sand tigers. I feel like that's the one that seems to be kind of the most popular because sand tigers are a pretty popular dive shark. But yeah, if you see a group of sharks together, it's called a shiver of sharks. So, which is an epic, epic collective name. So, um, and it's kind of fun. Not many people know that. I, I feel like people know pods of whales, but they don't really know shiver of sharks. So, fun shark club stuff, So. But speaking of the shiver, this is really interesting because we read about the bramble shark, that the bramble shark is solitary, so it likes to be alone. But this footage of the prickly shark, its close cousin, it's kind of interesting to see these guys aggregating. So, very interesting. And you have to wonder, since we don't know a lot about the bramble shark, do bramble sharks have ag aggregations? And the answer is probably because uh, when you think about like how do they coordinate mating like how like how does that even work you know so it's probably safe to assume that maybe at least for some parts of the year like bramble sharks might aggregate you know um, I'm kind of curious about what's going on here this is quite a few prickly sharks hmm. this is really cool footage by the way like it's like a it's this like pretty dramatic undersea or seascape and like it's just covered with these and these are big sharks these these, these are pretty sizable guys like uh definitely i can't assess how big it is because we don't have like the cool um the laser pointers um like a lot of submarine dives will have like um these two fixed laser pointers that will be set at a certain distance so you can accurately measure things so we don't have that i'm guessing just Kind of taking a visual ridiculous guess maybe five or six feet uh these look these look pretty big so uh, again i'm kind of loving that the prickly shark definitely has a much more flattened snout than the bramble shark bramble shark is looks a little bit chunkier and the bramble shark of course has like the bigger thorns so uh still both of them have very muscular head both of them have the fins Push back very far down on the body, which is very unusual looking. And uh, they're both unique as far as being a kind of rhinoforms. So these are the only two living species of a kind of rhinoforms that we know of so far. But um, but that's 
the smallest order of sharks. Um, yeah, uh, used to be hexanchiforms because you just had a handful of six gill, seven gill sharks and the frilled shark. But uh, this this takes it as like the rarest, smallest order at two species. So uh, pretty cool. Um, for those who were a little um, like like uh, any latecomers in the stream, uh, this is the bramble shark. Uh, so we've been watching prickly shark clips as comparison, but here's like tonight's focus, the bramble shark. And just as a quick peek at w you know what makes it different, you can easily see that it has more pronounced uh, thorns or or like um, these more pronounced like these white specks are pretty pronounced uh, dermal denticles that have like a thorn bramble like appearance. So this is where the shark gets its name. So otherwise it looks a lot like a prickly shark, but um, the, the thorns are definitely more prominent. So, And I still stand by what I said. I feel like the bramble shark's snout is not as flat as the prickly shark's. So gonna catch up on the comments. Oh, <laughs> shiver me timbers, it's a shiver of sharks. <laughs> Uh, Sir Douglas Bang, good question. Maybe prickly sharks are easier to find. Maybe. Um, maybe. Because uh, what's interesting is that a lot of the videos that I've been able to pull on YouTube are actually dive videos. So, um, like, some of them are deep water videos, but some of them are actually just, like, scuba diver videos. So maybe prickly sharks spend more time in shallow water than bramble sharks. Um, as far as I know, they're both deep water species. Yeah, prickly sharks definitely can enter deep water but it looks like the br prickly sharks can also come into water as four meters i'm just checking shark references over here or sorry uh sharks of the world okay that's actually a really cute shot of this shark that's actually really adorable i love his like little eyes um kind of reflect it yeah that's actually a little adorable and he's just like chilling there this is cool so this is a shark that is not moving, and that's a cool feat where uh, now he's kind of nudging up a little bit, but like that's kind of like neutral buoyancy. That's actually kind of a cool feature to see. Does make me think of, weirdly enough, it kind of does make me think of sand tigers. And those are completely different lines, but like, there's some similarities, like the billowing fins, like kind of like the large like backs, like the large smooth backs where it takes a while to get to the dorsal fin. Um, just that buoyancy. And I believe echinorhinoforms do have proportionally larger livers than other sharks, uh, which might help them kind of maintain neutral buoyancy. So, interesting. It's a little grainy, but it is still kind of cool to see how the shark is behaving um, in what seems to be a shallower water environment. Very cool. Very chill, very relaxed. Imagine, like, you know, swimming or snorkeling, you know, not too far down, or probably, I guess I should say scuba diving, because four meters is uh, quite a few feet, so you have to be pretty far from the beach but you know imagine diving and you come across one of these guys like you know and they're they're big uh, about the same size as bramble shark so uh around eight feet um you know could be maximum size about 13 feet so big big pup big boy oh, i kind of love this video title majestic prickly shark at veterans park redondo beach so same location as the other video let's make that full screen just to kind of get a good look at this guy. And it's kind of cool, a little eerie to see this at night. Uh, night diving is a more, oh, this is kind of, there we go. Night diving is like more of an advanced form of diving, um, as you can imagine. Like it's already, it's already very disorienting to be underwater in the daytime. Uh, it's very hard to get your bearings. Um, it just It's such a different environment. You wouldn't think that that would be an issue, but that's a pretty serious issue. Um, and then to imagine multiplying that effect at night where it's like you, you really can't see anything beyond your like flashlight or torchlight. Uh, yeah, really cool stuff. So um, <laughs> I'd like to do night diving someday. 
Uh, but I gotta get I gotta get some basics in first. Uh, so I'm excited for uh, another thing I'm looking forward to with the weather warming up is I have to get recertified. So this is the year to do it, which I'm really excited about. Um, doing basic certification out of uh, Virginia Beach. I'm gonna gonna get uh, open water certified. So I'm super excited about that. That's like a big fun thing to do for this year. But anyway. This guy is just chilling. Uh, unfortunately, he's not coming closer to the camera, so we do have a couple other clips to take a look at if he doesn't make a pass. Uh, it's still, it's quite fun and really eerie to see him cruising in the dark. And yeah, there's a scuba diver, so this is pretty shallow water. <laughs> um, and again, these sharks are considered to be harmless to humans, so, you know, not no real need to... Um, go after large, even though these are large animals, um, doesn't seem, they're not active hunters, like the way, um, kind of as a rule of thumb, um, if a shark's fins look pretty sharp and crescent-like, it means that they're very active hunters, very fast swimmers, you know, more or less. If a shark has kind of like fat, broad fins, usually it means they're a little bit more sluggish, usually it means they like to spend their time more at the bottom. Um, and what's really cool is like stuff like that or like stuff like analyzing the teeth. Um, there are physical clues, you know, if you kind of like train your eye for them, there are physical clues that you can use to get a sense of like, even if you don't know, you haven't observed directly what a shark is doing, you can kind of get a sense of maybe it's biology based on some physical features, you know, because those physical features were derived evolutionarily from like a need that was evident in the world. Um, that's kind of like the name of paleontology, uh, where it's like, we don't, we can't observe things like a, a T-Rex, you know, in a while, but we can judge based on like its teeth and its skeleton, like, oh, this is probably a scavenger, maybe a hunter, something that needs to like gnaw through huge chunks of flesh. Um, I don't know, I'm just kind of going into a ramble again, but ramble, bramble. Uh, this is really cool. Uh, this is Prickly Shark Three Sisters site, Costa Rica very famous dive site uh but this is really cool because you've got this fun display um and it kind of is in theme with the music that i have for tonight uh subnautica uh i've never played subnautica but i've heard that game is terrifying um and super fun and um it's all about like building like a marine base um while avoiding these giant predators around you and you have like a, a heads up display hud like this uh so it's it's, it's just kind of cool to see a display like this i think howard you drew something um with this kind of display uh which is it's just super cool to see it play out in real time so uh play out in real life so 341 meters so this is a submarine uh in the twilight zone uh this is really cool there's actually a lot of fun things to see here um so temperature, uh, 11 degrees Celsius. It's actually not too freezing considering how far down we are. But then again, it's, you know, tropical, tropical uh, part of the world. Salinity is 34, uh, 34.8 grams per liter. I'm not sure if that's the same as parts per thousand. It looks similar as far as like what the number would be. So just basically full seawater. It's so cool to see the shark down here. Pressure is 497 PSI. So at the top of the stream, I was talking about how, like, you know, one of my car tires was, like, losing pressure, losing PSI. Uh, let's see what that is compared to a car tire. Because uh, my car, my tires need 36 PSI. Uh, so this is 14 times the pressure needed to inflate a tire for, for road safety. So, like, that's crazy. That's a lot of pressure. Imagine putting like 498 PSI of air in your tire, 14 times the amount. Yeah, it would explode. So, uh, kind of shows you like how crazy deep water animals are, like how wildly adapted they are. Like this shark seems sluggish, but it's huge. It's alive. It's an active swimmer, and it's living in an environment where you have like that much pressure acting on its body and it can live in that environment. You know, that's it's really cool. Uh, another um, fun fact is like, uh, another way to look at pressure is um, an atmosphere 
like Earth's atmosphere is equivalent to 10 meters of water. So this is 34 atmospheres like crashing down on this one animal, you know, <laughs> like, or like all the animals at, at this um, deep water environment because it's 343 meters down. So that's 34 atmospheres. So 30, 343 meters divided by 10 meters per atmosphere is 34 atmospheres of Earth. Yeah, it's crazy. Deep, deep, deep sea, deep sea diving is no joke. And uh, I, I feel like we're at an age where we're not taking it as a joke anyway. But um, yeah, it's 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 incredible. Like the, the the forces, like the physical forces acting on, you know, the animals that have lived here. Um, and it actually amazes me that sharks like the bramble shark or prickly shark can have a depth range where they can actually go from shallow to deep water. That's like just as impressive as a as a shark or a fish going from like fresh to salt water. Uh, that's that's just as much of a physical challenge, I would argue. Um, you know, it's pretty drastic when you think about like you go from, you know, that much pressure acting on your body into like a, a safer, not safer, but like like a, a low pressure environment. Uh, when you think about scuba diving in general, like for human scuba divers, you know, they have to be very careful going down even just like well like uh huh i was about to say like 50 meters and that's kind of extreme actually um like 20 meters 30 meters and like they have to do safety stops and then you know for extended dives they have to go into these like um uh depressurizing chambers or um like like these special chambers when they get back on the boat to just and just sit there to like get used to the atmosphere again it, it, it's just like astronauts you know it's it's like different direction but same concept where it's like you can't just like fly to space and come back to earth and be okay like you have to condition your body to get back to get used to what the, the normal pressure is for like a human body um so all that all that in mind is just it's just amazing to see sharks or any kind of marine organism that lives in a deep water environment make migrations up to or like swim swim up into shallower water and vice versa it's crazy to think about like the physical challenge of that so these guys are so cool uh, they're actually even though they look sluggish physically they're I mean, and they, they look sluggish they look gentle but physically they're kind of impressive and a little intimidating actually um, big animals with gnarly teeth um, I know they're harmless to humans, but um, the more I look at this, the more I'm like, this is a weird, this looks like a weird version of a sand tiger. And I know those are really, really different sharks, very different lineages, but, you know, they, they have kind of similar vibes, similar habits, you know, so it's kind of cool. Just slowly hovering uh, kind of close to the seabed. Uh, having these large backs, big, beautiful snouts, uh, billowing fins. I mean, you know, again, they're completely different, but um, it's kind of cool to see, like, uh, yeah, it, they're different, but they, they have, they look a lot more in common than, like, you know, I was not expected to be reminded of sand tiger sharks tonight, but, like, there's, there's something about these guys that kind of, like, they could be different, completely different lineages, but arriving at a similar, like, body plan. It's pretty interesting. Hope you guys have a good snack or drink tonight. We got a uh, cinnamon tea. Uh, a really good friend of mine sent this to me, uh, which is really sweet. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a uh, nice, nice Monday night vibes. This is our last clip of the prickly shark. Um, also a deep water clip uh, on the seabed. It's kind of cool to see this desolate environment and this shark just patrolling by itself. You can kind of see some, uh, I don't know if those are brittle stars or feather stars. Um, we just passed one, maybe we'll see another one. But it's kind of cool to see this guy. It can be anywhere in the water column, but it's choosing to be close to the bottom probably you know looking for prey items or sensing if there's anything buried in the sand it's kind of cool
And it's fun to see this, like, you know, like, desolate seascape. You know, especially with the music. I don't know if you guys can hear that in the background, but it's pretty fun. And look at that. So <laughs> look how far down that is. I'll keep saying this every time we see a submarine clip, but I would I would love to go down in the submarine, you know, and just, like, take a look at some of these sharks, so. And if my girlfriend is watching, you're coming with me. So, <laughs> like, or we could talk about it. But uh, <laughs> I think it will be re really cool uh, just to, like, you know, someday. This is a bucket list thing. Um, this is this is totally something I would love to do someday. And I'm kind of curious... It might, I don't know, it might happen. I mean, I think we're still very much firmly in the age of deep sea diving like this being really more research oriented and not available to the public. But, um, you know, we'll see if that changes in my lifetime. But anyway, beautiful shots of the species, beautiful shots of the, uh, <laughs> beautiful shots of the prickly shark. <laughs> So, what's really cool, and I did not point this out earlier, but you can see um, the lateral line, uh, how prominent that is. So, again, that's that uh, pressure sensing, um, I guess you would say that's an organ, but uh, pressure sensing feature that all sharks and all fish have. Um, it's really cool to see how prominent it is on this shark, but um, this feels vibrations in the water column. Um, and if a fish swims nearby, exerting pressure on water molecules, the lateral line picks it up and allows the shark to sense pressure around it. It's cool to see the senses at play where you have that. You have the sense of smell, sense of sight. The uh, ampullae Lorenzini on the other underside of the snout sensing electrical pulses in the environment, which is really cool. Uh, should I just had a random, random tangent, never mind. Um, I had a random thought, but I don't know. I mean, Sense of hearing, sharks can hear. Yeah, sharks can hear. Sorry, that that was a that was a really random, random moment. Like, cause like sharks have like an inner ear, and sound does carry much faster in water than in air, which is actually really it's really surprising how far sound carries. So, uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one. I guess sense of touch. Sorry, sharks bumping and biting. So. <laughs> But uh, I'll catch up on the comments while we're watching this clip. Let's see what we got. Da, 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 da. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I just saw that. Um, oh, interesting. Sir Douglas Bain uh, kind of makes me think of a basking shark. Uh, yeah, just kind of like the slow movement, like kind of like that like relaxed pace. Uh, so pretty cool. Uh, Minja's night diving sounds horrifying. Uh, it's a, it's something I would like to do. It, it, it does sound absolutely terrifying. Um, it, it is something that like, I like full disclosure, it would, it would freak me out. It would take some time for me to adjust to that. Um, but I would like to do it. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but I feel like if I saw that shark face while panicking underwater, I'd calm down. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Cause he has a cute face. Prickly shark has a cute face. Oh, Howard, great. Oh my gosh, yes. That's what the Cooper River is like when they dive for meg teeth, except it's also full of alligators. Yeah, so my, um, our good friend, uh, Graham, Graham Bryant, who, um, super cool guy, uh, like he sent over a bunch of Megalodon teeth and Car uh, Carcocles anguistidans teeth last year. So uh, some of our viewers received some teeth um in last year's contest and uh you best believe we're gonna have more fossil contests this year um but those teeth came from the cooper river so um what it is is like graham and uh some of his like dive group um they would go into this ridiculously murky water uh in south carolina that's really advanced diving honestly like where you go into this water you can't see and you go down, you know, you have to feel on the seabed. You only have, like, a foot of visibility, if even that. You have to feel for these, like, megalodon teeth. And it's really cool, I mean, because, like, those teeth are beautiful. And, you know, for those who are kind of more, like, trying to sell them, you know, they're pretty valuable. And, um, you know, like Howard said, uh, it's South Carolina. And there's alligators. So, like, 
you know, and there's water moccasins, you know, so it's like you, you, you're, you're really rolling the dice on that one. Um, so it makes the teeth that we got from the Cooper River that much more special. Um, so I'm pretty sure, Howard, you have one of those teeth, which is really cool. Uh, for our newer viewers, uh, we're definitely going to have another fossil contest soon. Um, so more to come on that because I still have a bunch of those, those precious Cooper River teeth. So, but, uh, to share in, uh, a future competition, uh, for this year, but not, not too distant future. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, how are all today is a really interesting book on paleontology and reconstruction of fossils or, or sorry, that was Sir Douglas Bain. Sorry, Sir Douglas. Uh, yeah, I'm going to star that as well so I can keep, uh, keep a tab on that. That's really cool. Uh, very cool. Uh, Minja, so what you're saying is that shark has enough pressure to fill 14 tires. Yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and Sir Douglas, but it will swallow shark wood. Oh my gosh. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, Minja, saw your comment, uh, laugh my ass off and wish her luck in the submarine. Uh, I may or may not have received a text saying we're not doing that. So, <laughs> like, um, so. Oh, uh, Sir Douglas, good question. Is density why sound is faster in water? Very good question. I am not sure why. Um, that's a great question. Uh, why sound is faster? Why sound travels so much faster in water than air? Uh, actually, let's look that up, because that's, that's an excellent physics question. Um, this is one of my favorite parts of the stream, by the way, where it's like, um, you know, full disclosure, I mean, I don't, I don't know everything, so, uh, it's fun to kind of, like, you know, like, literally learn live. Um, why does sound... Oh, sorry. Why does sound travel faster in water? Faster in water. Oh, you're right. Okay, so sound travels faster in water compared with air because water particles are packed in more densely. So it is the density. Very cool. So what's uh, more of a like like what's a kind of like a practical consequence of that? On the one hand, um, they makes for human uh, human communication. It kind of makes things a lot easier as far as like you think of like submarines or a more day-to-day -day example you do think of divers where um if i was in trouble underwater i could just like you know find like a rock or something and just like gently tap the tank or the fin or something and that would carry that would be really loud under the water and it would instantly reach my buddy who might be like really far away um if i did the same action on land um there's no way that that sound would carry um as quickly so there's benefits like that but then you do think about uh, the consequences, and a big thing to think about is whales. Uh, this is why there's so many strict whale laws as far as like how close you can be to a whale, uh, because the noise of boats and ships carries really, really far. Like like you know, the sound of a ship's propeller goes really, really far and creates this like really unbearable loud radius around it. Um, so there's really strict rules about like if you see a whale, um, you can only be X amount of um, yards or like, kilometers away from it. Um, I let's look, let's look that up. I know I know every country is different, but um, it's whale distance. Whale distance. See, see what the US, US does. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, 100, 100 yards from large whales, whales 50, yards 50 yards from dolphins. From dolphins. Um, and, and then, then there's some whales, whales, whales like, it's like, yeah, yeah 200, 200 meters, meters, you gotta be, you gotta be very careful, careful. So, so, oh, sorry, oh, 200, 300, 300 yards, yards, so, so, um, um but yeah, but yeah, so, so, so uh, but yeah, uh, whales, whales, um, um you know, you know whale migration whale routes, routes, anything that's loud that's underwater is a big deal. Uh, you know, that's kind of like the big thing, um, as far as like underwater audio, so. Speaking of audio, I think the music died, so I'm just going to go fix that really quick. I'll be back. There we go. Alright, sorry about that. So, um, I'm trying to think of other things as far as underwater communication um, or underwater sound. Um, 
fish do communicate, um, specifically a group of fishes called the drums, which are aptly named. Um, they can rub their... Um, they have a feature kind of around their gills, um, but like like on the in, in, like in the inner like kind of around their mouth, kind of around their gills, and I forget if they're otoliths or pharyngeal teeth. I forget what that feature is, um, but it's it's these bones, and I think it's otoliths. It's these bones um, kind of around the head of drums that um, they rub together and they make these like you know kind of loud sounds, um, which is why they get the name drum. And those carry pretty far underwater, and that's a form of communication between those fish. Um, so, which is kind of cool, um, and they've evolved that feature because there's something useful about communicating um, or like making sounds underwaters. Um, that's our underwater. <laughs> yeah. um, but another one, I mean, we talked about swell sharks, you know, or uh, swell sharks bark, uh, you yeah, know, where they are taken out of the water. But um, you know, that it's it's like a lot of there's a lot of creatures that even though you know. The ocean has been called the silent world. Um, you know, really, there's actually a lot more activity and a lot more noise going on uh, than when you, when you would first think. And part of it is that unique medium of water where sound carries really far. So, but catching up some more comments. Oh, thank you, Howard. I uh, just want to make sure that audio is good. So, thank you. Um, I think, let's see if I have anything else from Sharks of the World on Bramble Sharks. And I don't think I really do. Uh, and I didn't realize it was already 10. So I think let's take a look at some research. So here we go. Um, there was one thing in particular that looked really cool. And I've got a lot of fun things to review. But this one is very... I've never We've never seen something like this before. So I feel like this will be a fun one to do tonight. An inventory of bramble sharks, a kind of rhinus brucus, in natural history collections worldwide for conservation status assessment. This is by uh, Frederick H. Mullen and Samuel P. Iglesias. Uh, this is really interesting to me because these weird images right here um, are pretty famous as far as bramble sharks go. And some like shark textbooks or shark books um, have these as the only image uh, for bramble sharks. So um, I'm very curious about this as far as like the zoo collection, uh, like zoo collections as far as like um, preserved specimens for ichthyological study. Uh, so we'll take a look at it. Because we've never really seen something like this and it's kind of fun to see. I love this like um, spread in the beginning uh, where I know it looks a little gruesome, oh, it looks pretty gruesome to see, um, you know, some of these bramble shark images. But it's also kind of cool to see, like, kind of just from a museum standpoint, collection standpoint, you know, just the focus on some of the unique features where you have a Echinorhinus spinosus, that is an old name from Bramble Sharks. You have, again, those very charismatic teeth that are very strange looking. Um, the also charismatic dermal denticles right here. So these really prominent thorns. I believe that is a brain, Bramble Shark brain. Um, shark brains look very different from other brains. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a brain of a bramble shark. Crazy. Uh, not sure where this is. I also almost want to say it's a heart, but I am not 100% sure where that is. So, uh, but yeah, we'll check it out. So, abstract. So we'll read the abstract and then we'll just kind of like, you know, breeze through the rest. So. Many elastomeric populations were already depleted well before fishery surveys had even started, which means historical investigations are needed to reveal their ignored declines. This is probably the case for the bramble shark Echinorhinus brucus, which was named in 1788. That's crazy. 1788. So we've known this shark. This is one of the earliest sharks we've ever known. Uh, first one is... Might be Linnaeus, who named, like, the dogfish and the white shark in 1754. Uh, but yeah, the earliest sharks that we have named are in the mid-1700s, uh, which is kind of crazy. So, but anyway, sorry. Bramble shark, whose populations in Europe are suspected of having decreased significantly. In order to document this data deficiency, an inventory of bramble shark material that had been preserved in natural history collections was conducted in the period of 2014 and 2022. A total of 128 collections were contacted around the world. 
and additional sources of information were traced and consulted, for example, collection labels, museum registers, digital databases, index cards, pictures, manuscripts, and publications. This takes me back to college, man. Um, this has resulted in a list of 234 entries subsequently assigned to 169 individual bramble sharks. These exhibits are or have been deposited in 80 different collections spread over 22 countries, whereas the other 48 collections yielded no results. At least 40 entries are presumed lost, so fewer than 200 entries have been preserved to date, some of them in bad condition. Due to their historic and scientific importance, extensive efforts to preserve these specimens are more than justified. A significant number of 64 individuals, representing more than 30% of all specimens that were recorded in the survey, have never been published and are reported here for the first time. This is really cool. Uh, associated geographical data and collection dates are present for nearly all specimens. These new historical records can add significantly to our knowledge of the bramble shark's relative abundance and geographical distribution in time. These data will be included in the ongoing bramble shark cold case. <laughs> what? The bramble shark cold case, a project that will document is suspected decline and to implement appropriate conservation measures for this iconic, little known, and endangered shark species. Bramble shark cold case. Interesting. All right, so we'll kind of fast forward. We don't need to read everything. Oh, I do want to keep, what is this? All right. Oh. Oh, actually, wait, there's a couple interesting things here. In contrast to other shark families, the lateral line in the Chimeranidae is open and internally enforced with C-shaped cartilage structures as seen in holocephalins, which are chimera. Uh, so that's weird and interesting. So that's actually, yeah, that's, didn't know that. Um, this project, also called the Bramble Shark Cold Case, resulted in a wealth of new historical information. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, it should be noted that the Bramble Shark Cold Case was started at a time when this species was still listed as data deficient by the IUCN. 2018. In the meantime, preliminary results of the project have contributed to the to update the bramble shark's conservation status to at least endangered. But action plans and specific conservation measures, regional, national, global, have not been defined nor implemented to date. So that's really cool and actually really concerning. Um, so for the longest time, we've known this species for, you know, what is that, 300 years almost, 250 years. And we have not know we ha we haven't really known what its conservation status is until now, which is in danger, uh, endangered, uh, partially as a result of this uh, uh, study. So that's actually pretty wild. Uh, so this is a very consequential paper right here. Let's see. Uh, it talks about the old name, a kind of random spinosis. Hmm. Let's see. Talk about the methods. We don't really need to do that. This is kind of cool. Oh, that's actually really cool. So here's like a cool summary of collection materials. So United Kingdom, France, Italy, Belgium, South Africa, Brazil, Australia. So most of the Bramble Shark stuff uh, is from Europe and specifically, well, United Kingdom and Italy. You got uh, classification of different things like the jaws, complete specimens. Most of the Bramble Sharks come from the Mediterranean and Northeast Atlantic. Most of them were collected in the 19th and 20th century. We've got one bramble shark from the 17th century, which is kind of cool. Wow. Um, we'll kind of keep looking. What is this? Okay. Oh, this is cool. 
So uh, here's a cool map of where bramble sharks have been collected. Um, so this kind of is interesting to line up with this range map right here. So let's go back. Oh, I think I lost where this was. Oh, there we go. Okay. So here are the individual collection points. And um, kind of on this part of the United States, it looks like there's one around Massachusetts, New Hampshire, a couple around New York area, and then one around maybe North Carolina, kind of Virginia. And so it's interesting to see that extrapolated on this range map where, you know, this range is kind of like a guess. You know, it's not really an actual range. It's more like, yeah, we caught it within this little guess bubble, if you will. Um, so it kind of makes sense that the, this map is actually maybe not the most accurate as far as, like, the Chesapeake Bay is concerned. So, interesting. Uh, lots of collections in Europe, and specifically, look at that. Lots of collections in the United Kingdom, um, like, southern England, and in France. So, and, um, yeah, this is crazy. Okay, here we go. So, Bramble Shark... Uh, museum material. So this one, this this is a very famous. Um, photograph doesn't show me right off the bat um, where this is from. It's so these this is a Belgian um, bramble shark, but it doesn't show like you know the date it was collected. But still, it's very fa it's fascinating to see. Um, we don't really get to see the museum side of things too much uh, on the stream. So it's kind of cool to see a different angle on um, shark science, where museum specimens are pretty important, where, you know, in this study, the focus is on, like, what are the records and what patterns can we deduce from the records? But, you know, collected specimens can offer a lot of information as far as, like, you know, anatomy or um, genetics is a big thing. You know, because, like, you had the DNA in the collection, so, very interesting. Um, fun random fact, um, these cards really bring me back, because um, uh, in the Virginia Sea Marine Science uh, ichthyology collection, um, I helped identify some species, and uh, my name is actually on some of these cards in that collection, so... Um, I have to go back there at some point just to kind of like uh, check that out actually. <laughs> um, so, but uh, how these cards work is, you know, you record uh, with your specimen, um, ideally where was it found, when it was found, who found it, what is it, um, geographic coordinates, um, and really, I mean really those are kind of like the main pieces of the data you need. So uh, for me, I don't think I was given, I was given specimens, uh, a lot of what I had was specimens that we didn't really exactly know where they came from, but we needed to classify what they were. So most of the ones that have my name on it um, are specimens that I had to classify and identify taxonomically. Um, so it just brings me back. Uh, museum collection stuff is always very interesting to me. So, Oh, is that it? Oh, no, that's not it. I think, if I'm reading this correctly, we might get a lot of photographs. Unless these are just a whole list of sources. Oh, no, we do get some photographs. Here we go. Wow. Okay. It's actually a really beautiful layout of bramble shark teeth. Again, there's nothing else like this. These are weird shark teeth. Oh, hey, uh, sorry to talk this pain. I just saw your comment. Specifically, all today's is a thought exercise on reconstructing modern animals based only on the bones to show how little we know about the extinct species. That's really cool. Uh, please let me know if, if there's uh, kind of particularly fun animals from that. Because one that sticks out to me is a horse. Like, a horse skeleton looks terrifying. Like, horses look really scary. Like, like if you if you just look at the skeleton. And uh, that would be kind of a cool one to see. I gotta, I gotta get this book. Um, cause that would be a really cool one to see. Um, I'm trying to think what else would be, I guess whale skeletons would be interesting to kind of screw up. So, 
Um, let's see. Really cool um, photographs of the. Look at the thorns, actually. That's actually a beautiful photograph of the dermal denical, and that is huge. So this shark is aptly named, as far as you know, that name Bramble Shark. That's so cool. And look at that. Great setup of the teeth right here. I would not want to be bit by this, you know? Um, and I know I'm not the primary prey item, but uh, still, that is a wicked set of teeth. These are not like flat crushing teeth. Uh, these are chainsaw blade teeth. These are, these are really, really, probably really great for scavenging. Um, as far as like slicing a big chunk of like if there's like whale fall or something this would probably be a really great thing for that shark to eat uh, it's got the teeth to do it um, it really like that conveyor belt really does look like or that that chain of teeth really does look like dogfish teeth where dogfish will bite onto something twist their entire body around it to yank off a big piece of flesh so you know i would imagine these sharks probably really like whale falls like de dead whales falling to the seabed um, I feel like it's a good guess for what they eat. Let's take a peek at Florida Museum of Natural History because I, I think we might have skipped the biology part. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, bramble sharks eat a variety of bony fishes, small sharks, and crabs. Um, I still suspect, I suspect they probably would like to maybe munch on whale meat, but um you know like like dead dead whale but uh yeah small sharks is kind of cool so it's kind of cool to see that these sharks actually go after other sharks wow. very interesting let's see some other museum stuff Oh, yeah. Some of this, I, I promise we won't dwell on some of the creepier looking stuff. Um, cause some of these specimens are very damaged. This one is from 1884. Wow, that's crazy. Hmm. Look at these notes. Like, beautiful handwriting, too. 1885, Australian Museum, 1885. May 1885. That's wild to think about. Huh. It's incredible to think about the natural history. Th this is literally natural history. You know, like the, like the Natural History Museum. Like, this is literally it. You know, in terms of, like, where... As far as, like, the documentation process goes. This is very interesting. Uh, these are pretty damaged looking teeth. Let's see where this is from. It's an Australian museum collection. 1887 or 1987? 18... no? 1851? What do we got? 1931. Sorry, there's a lot of different dates bouncing around here, but I see on the card right here. Look at that. I remember these, yeah. Uh, 1931. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, this is actually, this is a great example of these cards. So, you've got the museum collection name, National Museum of Victoria, Echinorhinus brucus, the species name, no data on the locality, 1931. I realize it's getting a little late, so uh, I promise I won't dwell too much on this, but I just think this is fascinating. Nineteen fifty-eight. So this is a shark from nineteen fifty-eight. Uh, no, it's a name from seventeen eighty-eight. But these are still late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds specimen. That's crazy. Wow. Man, this wild stuff. Okay, I, I think we'll move on from this in a little bit. Because, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's like, it's actually a well-preserved specimen. 
That's actually a really great photograph. Um, where is this one from? No, it has acronyms. It, show, it doesn't show me. This is a shark from Brazil. But that's actually a really well-preserved uh, specimen. And, like, look at the head where, like... Look how, look how prominent these thorns are on the body. That's crazy. Like, this shark is aptly named as far as, like, Brambly Shark goes. Like, it, or, sorry, Bramble Shark. Ha, <laughs> Brambly Shark. Bramble Shark. Like, you can, you can definitely see where it gets that, so... And you can also see, like, that old name of Echinorhinus spinosus. Um, yeah, that's a well-deserved name. Uh, that's not a bad name as far as this goes, so... Because that is pretty unique as far as sharks go. All right, just going to fast forward to see if there's anything else of interest and then we'll move on. Oof. Now, okay, this is probably a good one to end on actually because, and I'm sorry, I apologize, this is kind of gross, but um, this is an excellent one to end on because look at this. Hey, do you remember like when we were looking at like old art? And um, figure C, like, you know, there are some sharks that look so wonky. Well, figure C is a highly damaged bramble shark specimen. And it looks like this sharp nose, like, emaciated looking thing. But the reality is, it's just a completely damaged specimen. So some of those old artworks that we saw probably were accurate. And uh, just, you know, unfortunately, they had sharks that they didn't really preserve very well. And, um, you know that has created bias in the visual representation of the animal so oh man oh i know yeah i just saw i just saw your comment been just eek yeah i i agree it's it's a little creepy so uh yeah mm -hmm. uh oh sir douglas bane elephant and cow oh those are good ones uh horses were predators yeah <laughs> hippos swans were spooky and pythons are goofy <laughs> Very cool. Uh, how are care? It's mummified. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if we had like a mummified. Uh, this is just really random, but imagine if we had like a mummified dinosaur. That'd be the coolest thing. Uh, we've had mummified mammoths uh, discovered, but. Uh, but yeah. Pretty cool stuff. All right. Let's get back to the land of the living, uh, with some modern uh, species accounts. Um, and I think a good place to start would be... Oh, here we go. That's actually a nice place to start. So there's a couple ID guides. Some of them are FAO guides. Some of them, I think, are different publications. But uh, it's cool to see the Bramble Shark represented uh, in a pretty healthy way. Like, there's actually quite a lot of literature on this species. So here is a happy, full, robust Bramble Shark. Um, with, again, those prominent thorns on the body. Really cool illustration. Uh, Bramble Shark, uh, in this language, this is Bramhai. I forget what language that is, but let's see. Description. Endangered species. Circumglobal but sparse in cold temperate to tropical seas. Lives on or near the bottom, usually between 200 and 900 meters, but may be found closer to the shore. Uh, threats taken as both targeted incidental catch across its range in demersal trawl, long lying and set net fisheries. The species has been frequently reported across most of, it, most of its range. In Namibia, this species has been take, recorded as bycatch in the bottom trawl fishery for hake. Ooh, and at least one bramble shark has been caught by a shore based angler in N Namibia. When caught by anglers, they should be handled carefully and released immediately. Interesting. Uh, hake are fun fish, by the way. Uh, they, they, I used to take care of hake uh, in an aquarium, and they, they remind me of, like, it's like whatever you would feed hake. It, it, it always reminded me of, like, feeding, like, puppies. You know, they, they're, they're very cute. Um, so they don't look cute, but they act very cute. So um, Hake are, like, a, a funny cousin of cod. Um, they look, they're very long and have these big mouths and big appetites, so... Uh, here's a nice profile of the Bramble Shark, so kind of right as Brucus. Uh, oh my gosh. Here's some old names, uh, old Latin names or old scientific names, so here we go. Squalus Brucus. Uh, Squalus is really funny because everything at one point was Squalus. Everything was called a Squalus at one point, so. 
I think real shark nerds, like, I think it can, I think there's a joke there, like, just, you know, but that's, that's a serious degree of shark nerdiness. Anyway, Squalus brucus, Squalus spinosus, Echinorhinus spinosus, Skynus spinosus, Echinorhinus obesus, I kind of like that one, uh, Echinorhinus spinosus, Echinorhinus macquarii, which is kind of lame because it's named after a person. Uh, but we settled on Echinorhinus brucus. Let's see what that means, by the way. Echinus means spiny or sea urchin, referring to the thorn like denticles, brambles in the body. Uh, fun trivia question, by the way. Uh, what spiny Australian creature uh, kind of has this name? Like, you know, you have it's the same root, Echinos. Like, uh, Bramble Shark's Latin name is Echinorhinus, but there's a Australian spiny animal that also has that uh, Greek root, the Echinos root. Uh, who is it? Like, uh, please type your comment in the chat uh, who that, uh, what that animal is. Yes! Min just got it! Echidna! Echidna! Same, same root. So congratulations! I'm going to star that. So Echinus Echidna uh, derives from the same thing, uh, spiny. Um, what's kind of cool is echinoderms, uh, which are sea urchins and starfish, uh, same Latin root, uh, spiny. So, uh, referring to the thorn-like denticles, brambles on the bi body. Uh, rhinus, an ancient name for sharks from rhine, rasp, alluding to the shark's jagged rasp-like skin. And it's interesting because rhinus is also a name for snout, like rhinoceros, or like, um... Oh, uh, gosh. Rhinchodon? Uh, do I have that right? I don't know about Rhinchodon, because that's a whale shark's name. But rhin 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 means snout, though, because of rhinoceros, you know, like the horn. and um, I, have to, I have to look into that. I know rhin means snout, but anyway. Brucus, Latin for caterpillar, referring to, referring to chenille or chenille de mar, sea caterpillar. Locals named for the shark along the Atlantic coast of France. Wow, that's actually really adorable. So, wait, really? Well, okay, hold on. Brucus, Latin for... Let me read that again, because that, that's taken me a minute. Brucus, Latin for caterpillar, presumably referring to chenille or chenille de mar, which is the sea caterpillar. That's adorable. Okay. Sea caterpillar. Interesting Latin name. All right. We'll go back to what we were reading, but interesting. So the Latin name, the official Latin name is um, spiny, uh, spiny shark, sea, the sea caterpillar spiny shark, or like spiny snout sea caterpillar is what the Latin name literally translates to. So that's really funny. Uh, English names, bramble shark, French is squale boucle. Uh, Spanish is Tiburon de Clavos. So, very interesting. Nice uh, illustration here. Actually, that's a beautiful illustration. Nice uh, black and white. Uh, this is cool. A uh, cool view we haven't really seen. So you can see, like, the, uh, the thorns, like those brambles covering, uh, you know, pretty uniform pattern. Or not uniform, but, like, a uh, pretty high coverage on the underside of the head, which seems a little unusual, because you would think the underside of the head would be a little bit smoother. So it's interesting to see that bramble sharks have a wide variety of denticles. So you have a single sharp point, a group of sharp points, or just like a group of bumps. So pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is interesting. Vertebral centra poorly calcified. So the backbone, um, I mean, all sharks have like a cartilaginous backbone, which is already very flexible, but it sounds like this might be weaker. Primarily double cones, not calcified or weakly developed. That's interesting. And I, I don't, I wonder if that's a oh, strange adaptation for living in the deep ocean or, but a lot of sharks live in the deep ocean, you know, so 
And I don't think we've read that before, so... Interesting. So this is a regional field guide. Um, so, uh, Deep Sea Coralagenous Fishes of the Southeastern Atlantic. So it's showing um, this range in the southeastern Atlantic. Um, so South Africa to southern Angola, also recorded off Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Ivory, Ivor, Cote d'Ivoire. For, for, forgive me for pronouncing that horribly. Uh, elsewhere, right, wide ranging, but patchily distributed throughout the Atlantic, Western Indian, and Western Pacific Oceans, and Mediterranean Sea. Let's see. This bottom dwelling shark may occur in shallow water inshore in cold temperate areas and in places of upwelling so upwelling that phenomenon of deep water currents bringing nutrients up to the surface so that's actually a really productive zone um, a lot of animals lots of sharks uh, congregate in upwelling environments but primarily it is a deep water species occurring on the continental and insular shelves and the upper slopes let's see it may extend inshore in cold water to 18 meters or less and possibly into the surf line. Interesting. On the cold temperate west coast of South Africa and Namibia, it may move close inshore up submarine canyons where it's been regularly caught by shore side anglers on rod and reel, anglers on rod and reel and by small scale commercial fishers. So that's actually really cool. And some deep water sharks do this. So if it's a tropical zone, they'll stay in the depths. And then if it gets to be um, cold water, um, like a temperate zone or arctic zone, um, those sharks will come to the surface. So uh, a fun example that I really love, and um, I think Sir Douglas brought up basking sharks earlier, but basking sharks do that where, uh, you know, they're very famous up in like, you know, Scotland and New England and like, you know, the North Atlantic, they're very famous up here. And then they do occur in tropical areas but they're deep 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 down so like they will migrate and dive down like like to the twilight zone in places that like i think i'm pretty sure you can actually technically say basket sharks live off of florida but they're in deep water like where the water temperature is cold and stable so they'll move into deeper water during like um is it summer no it's not summer it's winter that they do that in winter, they'll move into colder, deeper water. Um, and then in spring and summer, when phytoplankton bloom, they'll come back up in shallow water, but they'll be in shallow water in colder environments. So like the Northeast and Northwest Atlantic. So, but it's really cool. There's a lot of sharks that do that where they like cold temperatures and um, in the tropical parts of the world, they like to stay on the bottom where it's freezing. And then in temperate parts of the world where it gets colder, it's like, oh, they'll come up to the surface. So it's kind of cool to read that for this guy. Uh, interesting biology, yolk sac viviparous. So that's actually no. Okay, so yolk sac viviparity. I don't know if that's a different way of saying ovoviviparity. So like eggs hatch inside the mother, but then are born live. Uh, number of young per litter ranging from ten to fifty-two. That's actually pretty prolific. Uh, it's been suggested that in Indian waters, these sharks may breed in the spring months, but a more recent study that examined over uh, 5,300 individuals throughout the year found that pregnant females had embryos in different stages of development and concluded that there does not appear to be a defined breeding season in Indian waters. Now that's fascinating. I don't think we've ever read that before. Embryos in different stages of development. That's... We've never read that. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard of that because usually sharks, shark embryos, like grow and are pupped in synchronization, you know, as like one unit. So, oh, well, but then again, you know what? Um, sand tiger sharks and a lot of lamniforms. Um, I don't know. I don't know because uh, sand tiger sharks and a lot of lamniforms, like they'll have their pups like grow pretty so they'll have some pups growing quicker than other pups and then the big pups will actually start eating their siblings in the womb it's really creepy uh kind of awesome but really creepy so maybe that's not as shocking as i thought at first so okay let's see uh, along the west coast of South Africa and Namibia, there are anecdotal reports of this species moving inshore during the late winter and early spring seasons. 
The diet of these sharks consists mostly of crustaceans and teleos, but also includes cephalopods and lazarbranchs. So interesting. We're not seeing whales. Um, I, I, I'm still holding on to my whale theory that like they eat whale fall, but we're not seeing that so far. So maybe I'm wrong. So crustaceans, teleos are like bony fish, uh, cephalopods, and lazarbranchs like other sharks. So very interesting. <laughs> a lot of nice information on this. Ooh. Uh, bramble sharks in most locations are taken as bycatch in deep sea bottom fisheries. Uh, there's a little information available on the numbers landed, except for a recent study in Indian waters where 17% of the bycaught sharks were of this species. That's actually kind of high. Uh, in 2005, a targeted fishery for Centrophorus, so that's gulper sharks, and those are endangered. Um, Centrophorus species off southwest India caught large numbers of bramble sharks as bycatch. Ooh. The estimated catch of bramble sharks in this fishery declined from 132 to 49 metric tons between 2008 and 2011. That's just three years. But it's not clear if this decline was due to fishing effort or a decline in fishing due to lack of a market for these sharks. Uh, during the mid-19th century, a small-scale targeted fishery for this species developed off Luteritz, Namibia, for its liver oil. In South Africa, the liver oil for the species is held in high value by traditional healers. Interesting. I don't think we've ever seen that before, either. I don't think we've ever... Like, we've seen fisheries develop for shark oil, but we have not seen it for that purpose of, like, traditional, like, medicine. That's interesting. The meat is of poor quality, and other than used for liver oil, it is not usually retained. Uh, local names. Bramhai, prickle, prickle shark, and bramble shark. Interesting. Large um, fetuses and small free-living bramble sharks lack the large plate-like denticles of juveniles and adults. So baby bramble sharks don't get their brambles. So they're very smooth looking. They probably look like, um, you know, prickly sharks uh, when they're born. And then when they get bigger, they get their um, brambles. So pretty interesting. Um, I just realized that it's uh, 1030. So uh, we should probably think about what next week's shark would be. Um, so... <laughs> Oh, cool. Sorry, I just saw your comment, Minjus. I never made the Iconodrome connection. I mean, honestly, you know, like, if, um, for any viewers who, uh, you know, maybe in high school or college and thinking about a language, Latin is very helpful. I know it is a dead language, but, like, um, it lives in a lot of ways. Uh, like, all of, like, science, um, you know, Latin is a huge part of, and especially biology, um, it's a huge part of it, uh, but there's also a lot of languages that, um, you know, Latin is a Romance language, just like Spanish and French, and so there's connections there, um, but honestly, it's a lot of fun to kind of, like, um, you know, when you look at, like, animals and nature, and you have their, like, scientific names, or the taxonomy, it's a very helpful language, um, that, you know, kind of, kind of unlocks connections, and, like, it's, it's just really cool, I, I really, I, personally like latin a lot and greek it's the same the same goes for greek but i feel like in at least the united states latin is an option to take more often than greek so but anyway what was that uh, <laughs> like, so i just had a flashback i watched uh indiana jones and the last crusade with my dad a couple weeks ago I think I think Indy has a scene where he's like he has to do the whole the challenges and he's like Jehovah except Jehovah spelled with an I because it's the Greek or Latin I forget it's helpful it helped Indiana Jones it helps biologists Latin is a good language so idiot Jehovah's an I <laughs> so anyway uh, this is a different I think this is a similar this is not what we just read was it. It's not. Okay, so this is a new paper, but uh, it is um, the same group, uh, FAO. I know I keep talking about FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, but this is like their 
bread and butter. This is like the this is like their really critically important stuff that it's available to fishermen, it's available to researchers and scientists. Like this is like the main guide. Like they make these really cool regional guides that have these nice profiles of different shark species. Um, and if you ever want to do a deep dive, um, I wonder if I can pull up the FAO website. Fish. I'm just going to do FAO. Fisheries and aquaculture. Let's try that. So the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, I hope it has... Man, I'm just going to type in shark guide because it has so many of these, like, shark guide. Let's see. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, these are so cool. Uh, so, like, field identification guide to sharks and rays of the Mediterranean Black Sea. Identification guide to common sharks and rays of the Caribbean. Uh, North Atlantic sharks relevant to fisheries management. A pocket guide. Let's click on that one just for fun. Uh, but these are so cool. There's these these publications are usually free and open to the public, and um, or I guess always free and open to the public. I just literally clicked on that, and here we go. And they're always like regional, and they have these like really cool like profiles on shark species in a regional mindset. So they're actually awesome. Um, so I love FAO guides. I think we might have seen this one before actually. Uh, and I'm curious if we we'll probably won't see the bramble shark, but just in case, I want to I want to take a quick peek because we are getting some cool sharks in here that are deep water. Oh, no, that's not it. Yeah, I'm just gonna scan through. Greenland shark. Oh, here's a familiar face, rough shark. So this is a different species, the sailfin rough shark, but a familiar group. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think they have bramble sharks in here. Uh, I guess a sand tiger. I know I've been talking about sand tigers a lot tonight, but similar vibe, totally different group and similar vibe. Yeah, these FAO guys are awesome. I highly recommend them out. Yeah, they're like, I'm 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 like, i um, FAO is the authority on shark names. So there's some species like um, the uh, piked dogfish, and I keep calling it piked dogfish because that's the FAO name. Um, uh, but there's some species of shark like um, that have multiple English names or multiple French names or Spanish names. And, um, you know, just to kind of streamline everything, like, yes, we have the Latin name, like Squalls acanthias, but uh, it is also helpful to have like a unified English name that should be official and should be like used across the world. Uh, what's kind of cool is that Sharks of the World, uh, very famous publication, only uses FAO names. So it will use the official FAO name as like the conventional, the naming convention for um, the English. Uh, shark entries. So uh, you probably have noticed that for Squalus acanthias, I keep saying piked dogfish, which is really weird because uh, in the United States, they call it spiny dogfish. Uh, most Americans say spiny dogfish for that species. Um, and I'm kind of unusual for saying pike dogfish, but the, the correct FAO name for English is pike dogfish. So um, so on that note, like Echinorhinus brucus, um, it's kind of cool that they have English, French, and Spanish. Uh, these are some of the main FAO languages. Um, you notice that uh, it's the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, French, English, and Spanish are some of, I think it's six languages of the United Nations. Or there's six main languages that all UN publications have to be um, produced in. So it's, if I remember this correctly, <laughs> English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, and Russian? Let me know if I got that wrong. 
I, I know it's six. Six languages of the United Nations. Let's actually look that up really quick. But, but it's kind of cool to see how it all ties together. Like, FAO is a part of the United Nations, and, you know, these names that we're seeing, the English, French, Spanish, you know, it's not a coincidence that of all the languages in the world, it's three of, like, the UN's official languages. So, hold on. Languages. United Nations languages. Let's see. I was right. Okay. Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. Those are the six official languages of the UN. So, gotcha. All right. Uh, let's see. We won't repeat information, so I'm just going to scan through this really quick. And this is actually really cool. So this is kind of closer to most of most of the viewers. Um, this is kind of closer to most of our current viewership. Um, you know, as far as the North Atlantic goes, and uh, this is interesting. Um, you know, I I pointed out earlier that this little gap between the um, S South Atlantic and New England Mid Atlantic kind of doesn't make sense and is a little weird. Um, probably doesn't matter. Uh, it's kind of cool to see on this map, it does not matter. It actually, yeah, there's no difference. So, it's interesting to see that. Uh, for this part of the world, uh, Bramble Shark is in the eastern North Atlantic from Norway and Northern Sea, Scottish and Irish Atlantic Slopes, Southwest England, France, Spain, and Portugal, including the Azores. Uh, in the western North Atlantic, it's North Carolina to Massachusetts. Same thing. It likes to be in places of upwelling, but it's primarily a deep water species. It might come inshore if it's cold. Let's see. I think we pretty much have the same facts. In the Western North Atlantic, it is very rarely caught, even as a bycatch species. Uh, and then from this study, it's saying the conservation is data deficient, but we know that got updated. Uh, that whole museum collection study uh, determined that the bramble shark is actually endangered. And then here we go, local names. The bramble shark, spiny shark, or spinous shark, England and USA. Man, this guy has got so many names. Casso, Pez Clavo. It's kind of cool to see how many cultures this shark touches. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same facts, so. Oh, cool. I'm just catching up on the comment. Sorry about the audio, guys. I don't know what's really going on with this, so um, I feel like it's been acting up a lot more tonight, so. Oh, cool. Minjus, it took seven years, honestly, such a fun language to learn. Latin, very, very cool. Uh, soup and shark, Howard. Um, I think that's fair game. Let me double check. Oh, and there is um, one cool study I do want to take a look at, um, and it's a fossil study of uh, prehistoric bramble shark teeth. So, uh, which I think would be really cool. But let's double check. I don't think we did the soup fin shark at all. So I just want to make absolutely sure because now this is episode what sixty two. So, uh, just checking our carcarida forms. We've got taupe shark. Let's see, weasel shark. You know what? Soup fin shark works. All right, let's do it. So, okay. Uh, let's just make sure. Oh, do you know what? You know what? We need a different species because uh, soup fin shark is the taupe shark. So I thought they looked familiar. So they're actually different names. <laughs> that actually is on brand for tonight as far as like sharks having multiple names. Um, so yeah, taupe shark and soup fin shark. Uh, you know what? Let's look up what the FAO name should be for soup fin shark. But, um, but uh, anyway, um, so yeah, we need a different shark from that. Um, and also, let me let me see if I can throw out a suggestion. Let's see if we can get a close cousin of the soup fin shark. Uh, K 
Kayla Rhinus, page 216. Because this is, this is actually a really great example of how this goes. Da, 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 da. I mean, this is a huge guide, by the way. I didn't realize it had rays as well. Right, 273. Okay, we could probably pick a shark from here, actually. 214. All right, Galeorhinus galeus. So this is the soup fin shark, but the official English name is taupe shark. So there we go. Interesting. All right, so let's see a close cousin would be... Ooh, the starry smooth hound, Musculus asterius. So we could do that next week. Um, that could be a close a close second. It's not the same as Galerinus. It's actually a pretty different group. Let me make sure there's not another kind of Galerinus. Just to make absolutely sure, I'm pretty sure Galerinus is one species. But yeah, I'm actually it's kind of funny. Like I'm kind of glad that happened in a weird way because it just shows how like important it is to have one name because it's like if you catch the same shark. And in some places it's called a soup fin shark, and some places it's called a taupe shark. Um, you can mistake them for two different species. Uh, I found something actually really cool, guys. Uh, this actually might be kind of... We might not get a lot of info, but it sounds really cool. Let me type it in here. Sailback hound shark gogolia. File, would I? That's the weirdest name, actually. Sailback hound shark, Gugolia fly would I? So that's the next. That's that's taxonomically kind of close to a soup fin shark. Um. Yeah, that actually would be kind of cool. So let me know what you guys think about that suggestion, and or keep keep suggesting other species as well. Um, but that might be kind of interesting to do next week. And that guy has like weird teeth actually this might be kind of a newer species too sailback hound shark gogolia fa woody what fa woody yeah fa woody so interesting um so i'll just leave that there before we wrap up for tonight there is a cool um prehistoric thing on bramble shark so i do want to take a look at this really quick um, this, and there's so much information on the species that um, we should probably take a look at the modern uh, status as well. But let's see. Bramble shark is a wide range of deep water shark. Near bottom. Uh, interesting. The bramble shark lives circling global around the world. The prickly shark, a kind of ran cookie eye, it's a fun name, uh, is only in the Pacific. Uh, the prickly shark bears only the small stellate identicals illustrated in many publications, while the bramble shark bears fewer and larger identicals which have a rounded base. Fossil record. Fossil brambles are known only from isolated but distinctive teeth and identicals. Numerous fossil occurrences of species begin with the upper Cretaceous of Angola. Upper Cretaceous. So this guy lived, like, th this group of sharks lived around the same time as T-Rex. That's crazy. That's wild. Wow. Like, so bramble sharks were around the, at the time of T-Rex. That's crazy. Cenozoic brambles have been reported from Europe, Africa, and the Americas north and south. Some of the species uh, listed are uh, Echinorize blakei from the Miocene of California. It kind of has Caspius, the legacy of the former USSR in California. <laughs> I kind of love that. Uh, it kind of has Priscus, the lower Eocene of Morocco. And it kind of has Weltoni, the upper Eocene of Oregon. Whoa! Uh, we have a kind of Priscus at present in the Eocene of Virginia. Woohoo! And it kind of has Blakei from the Miocene of Maryland, North Carolina, and California. Interesting. Now, this is fascinating, guys. Look at this. Uh, oh, because I, I was about to say, it kind of reminds Priscus, um, you've got these beautiful blade teeth, but you definitely don't have the points, right? 
But then in this thing, Economize Blake Eye, you definitely have the weird points. Kind of makes me think of like the Fire Nation logo, if for any Avatars fans out there, of which I am proudly a part. Uh, that's crazy teeth. Kind of reminds Blakey Eye here. Oh man. Uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, California, there's a place called Shark Tooth Hill Bone Bed. Wow. And that's where they got some of these teeth. That's crazy. Uh, the best chance of finding a tooth in one trip anywhere in North America is probably the upper uh, Olkey Sand. I'm not sure where that is. The STH bone bed is another matter, probably from... Okay. This is a cool website, by the way. I think we've seen this before. This is elasmo.com. The life and times of long dead sharks. So, uh, pretty cool, just devoted website. So, pretty, pretty cool. All right. Now, let's catch up on the content. Ooh, Howard, uh, Shark Tooth Hill is amazing. That is so cool. Like, uh, what, what do you know about it? Like, because um, it, it sounds awesome. Great name. Um, but I don't, I'm not really as familiar with Pacific uh, fossil assemblages. So uh, please leave a comment on anything you know about Shark Tooth Hill. But, and awesome. It sounds like the Sailback Hound Shark is a winner. So we will do this. Uh, it Like, just looking at the picture of it, I won't spoil it for now, but it looks strange in the best way possible it's it's actually a really cool looking shark so uh and the teeth also look strange um the best way i could describe it is like um a chinese fan uh except their blades so uh it's a really cool shark so i'm very excited to do sail sail, sail back hound shark gagolia fall woody next week uh, that's going to be really cool so um, before we leave we definitely have to we've been talking about how the bramble shark has extensive history but we don't know the conservation status until now. Um, and again, a big part of that is, where is that study? Is due to this study, this, this one with the creepy collection stuff. I mean, it was really important because it put together natural history that informed this, uh, the IUCN Red List New Assessment of Endangered. So this uh, species, and this was pretty recent, assessed in 2019, is considered to be an endangered species. So what makes the bramble shark endangered? Here we go. Uh, the bramble shark is a large deep water shark with a widespread yet patchy global distribution in the Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic, Indian, and Western Pacific Oceans. It occurs on or near the bottom of our continental and insular shelves at slopes at depths of 10 to 900 meters. Uh, the species is caught as target incidental catch in small scale and industrial fisheries using a variety of fishing gear. It's retained for its liver oil, which is considered one of the most valuable of shark liver oil and is an important marine resource for local communities. There's a high distribution overlap with intensive fishing pressure. It is thought to be locally extinct from parts of its range, and there is lack of species specific management across its entire range. The bramble shark was both estimated to have undergone a population reduction of 50 to 79% over the past three generations based on abundance of data and actual levels of ex exploitation and is assessed as endangered. So that's not good. Uh, the nice thing is having an assessment uh, like endangered means, okay, like we know the shark has a problem. What are we doing to help it? And this, is lay this lays a foundation in terms of creating a conservation plan um, or a focus on the species and it's kind of cool like again research like this uh, you just go through the museum collections and kind of you know creating a record of like hey you know where were these caught have you seen declines in abundance and it seems like um, based on the abstract they have so as creepy as that some some of that stuff is like museum collections can be helpful uh, from a conservation standpoint ironically so uh, conservation actions. Uh, currently, there are no spe species specific measures in place for the bramble shark. Targeted deep water shark fishing is not permitted in the CIOFA or Southeast Atlantic Fisheries Organization, CIFO, co convention area. Uh, further information is required on its distribution, ecology, and life history and interactions with fisheries. So, 
even though we don't have a plan yet, we do have a bedrock in the sense we know this is endangered. We don't have this classified as data deficient, which is kind of like this nebulous zone. We know it's an endangered species. So for future shark researchers, this is a really great one to study. I mean, and again, it's so encouraging to like go through these sharks on each stream and like see that like, wow, there's still so much we don't know. Like, I mean, you know, the perception in, I would say the past 30 years is like, we've kind of seen there, been there, done that. We've seen everything about sharks as, as far as pop culture goes. But the reality is, as far as research goes, we don't know. We really still don't know a lot about a lot of different sharks. So, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to see that that particular piece of research actually really uh, was beneficial overall to kind of get things started uh, in terms of like, okay, the bramble shark is endangered. What can we do about it? So it, it sub created a bedrock to take the next step. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> so it's 11 o'clock. So I think that was pretty much it as far as, um, I don't know if I had any other papers um, or images on the bramble shark. So uh, I think I want to end on uh, Howard's awesome drawing. Uh, but yeah, uh, let me move that so you guys can get a better view of that. Because uh, the footage is really cool, but it's usually of our prickly shark. So uh, I definitely want to end on the bramble shark properly. So um, catching up on comments, by the way. Whoa, uh, Howard, I have lots of teeth like uh, 500 Hemiprisa Sarah. Very cool, Snaggletooth shark as well as Mako and several other specimens from Sharktooth Hill. That's amazing. So cool. Uh, preservation is good, almost opalescent in some cases, but specimens are more fragile than typical East Coast specimens. Interesting. Yeah, because I've noticed that uh, East Coast specimens don't really have a lot of variation in color. Like, I get shark teeth that are usually black, dark brown, or sometimes, if I'm lucky, have a nice bluish grayish sheen but uh, for the most part there's a uniform color thing so iridescent shark teeth i think they're beautiful and they're not something i've seen so far here so and minjus uh it makes it such an exciting area to study agreed agreed love sharks and um personally i find it really encouraging that like you know for anyone who like maybe just feels like sharks are charismatic megafauna and we already know everything about them uh, you're in luck. We don't. And uh, you're needed as far as like shark research is still needed. A lot of it is still needed. So uh, go for it. It's it's a really, really awesome field of study. So uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I really, really appreciate uh, you, know, you guys being here and exploring the bramble shark. Um, very interesting species, uh, kind of surprising in a lot of different ways and uh, learned a lot. My favorite thing is just the gnarly teeth actually like the five cusps it's just super cool so oh howard uh really cool comment polk county florida are the most colorful i gotta check that out so i'm gonna i'm gonna look that up um you know like as far as shark teeth goes and like maybe maybe i should do a fossil trip actually <laughs> so um that'd be cool but anyway hope you guys have a great week and it's great to see you and we'll be back next week for the sailback hound shark so thanks guys cheers and i'll see you soon